Thanks, Sue. Hi, everybody. My name is Susie Wilson, and I'm a member of St. Michael's All Episcopal Church and part of the Christian Education Committee. We all go through major life changes over our lifetime. Some are wonderful experiences, and some can be quite challenging. In the beginning, I hated change, but as I've gotten older, I've learned to embrace it and take on the change, even if I didn't like it. And over time, I've had many journeys with my Christian education. I was born 52 years ago with two broken legs and a broken arm. Lucky for me, there was a doctor that came from Columbia Presbyterian Hospital who had started working at Greenwich Hospital in Connecticut the week before I was born. He knew about osteogenesis imperfecta, otherwise known as OI, or brittle bones disease, and he had the experience. Of course, this was overwhelming for my parents who had never heard of OI, and being their firstborn, had never been parents before. There was no OI foundation, there was no internet or support groups or any way to get information. It wasn't until 51 years ago that the OI foundation was created by a mom whose son was born with OI, and she wrote an article for Red Book Magazine. After that, the article she received numerous letters from others who were in the same boat as she, and soon five mothers started the OI Foundation. My parents were told by Dr. Worcester that although I had brittle bones disease, they should allow me to be as independent as possible and to treat me as if I didn't have a disability. Yes, there would be many challenges and hurdles ahead, but that shouldn't define me or stop me from doing what I needed to do to live an independent life. So my parents did that, just that. My dad was always my cheerleader and he was very creative at making modifications for me. The first seven years of my life, we lived in an apartment. Dr. Worcester had told me, or had told my parents, they really needed to build a pool because water therapy would be the best form of exercise for me. But living in an apartment, a pool was not in the game plan. So my dad designed parallel bars that would fit in our bathtub. He got me walking and we built up my leg muscles. The slide that should be showing now is when I was about four years old on our sailboat at Larchmont Yacht Club. I've had over 45 fractures and 15 surgeries. In the beginning, my femur fracture was always treated with Buck's traction. Buck's traction was a contraption which went around the bottom of my leg with an ace bandage. And at the end of that ace bandage was a rope. And the rope hung over the bottom edge of the bed. And at the end of the rope, there was a weight. And the weight would pull my leg out so that new bone could heal in between the fracture. So if a fracture is like this, I don't know if you guys can see, the space in between is what they were trying to fill in with new bone. Remember, this is 1968. And we had to put sandbags on either side of my leg to keep it in alignment. It usually took 18 weeks for my leg to heal that way. And then I would have to go through six months of rehab to build up all my muscles, particularly the leg muscles. We grew up in Larchmont, New York, and we attended St. John's Episcopal Church. I was baptized and confirmed there. I remember going to Sunday school and going to church with my parents, but never really could follow the service between flipping back and forth between the Book of Common Prayer and the hymnal. I always got lost in the service and was just plain bored like most kids. So growing up, God, I guess, was there, but I didn't really understand what that meant. But I do remember a situation when I was about six years old and I'd had a femur fracture and was in traction. 
I remember some of the ladies from our church coming to visit me and telling my mom, you go to the grocery store or go out for a while and get a break and we'll look after Susie. Now I knew these women, but after my mom left, it got really weird. The next thing I knew, these three women started praying over me and chanting over me. I was never so freaked out in all my life. They were trying to heal me and cure me, and I know their intentions were good, but boy was I terrified. I remember when my mom returned, asking her what it was all about and while they were, why they were doing that to me. See, for me, I was born with OI. It's something I'll always have for the rest of my life. I don't know what it's like to be six feet tall and not have OI. Also, I don't think of myself as disabled, even though I appear to be disabled. In 1976, I had to have my first rotting surgery on both of my femurs. Being in a body cast one whole summer was not a lot of fun, but my parents made it fun. Of course, it happened to be one of the hottest summers on record in New York, and we didn't have central air conditioning in those days. But being on the boat on Long Island Sound was always cooler than being home, and my pa parents figured out a way to take me boating on the weekends, even in a body cast. When I was 16, I learned how to drive. My dad was the one who encouraged me and made me a modified seat and extended foot pedals. Of course, my mom was a nervous wreck about me learning to drive, but I'm incredibly thankful for my dad because he made it happen and it opened up all kinds of doors and it has led me to be able to be more independent. I've never attended any of my graduations when I was in eighth grade, I broke my femur from walking. In high school, I was involved in youth group at St. John's Episcopal Church Larchmont and loved it. Bill Harper, who was our curate at the time, was young and always made our meetings fun. He always got everyone to participate and he always had a plan to incorporate me into everything we did. But Bill never looked at my disability as an issue and the rest of the youth group members didn't either, which was a great feeling. I remember the lunches and conversations we would have one-on-one, -on -one, and I remember what a special time that was for me. One of the conversations I re remember most distinctly was talking about what it would be like to have a house modified for me and my height, something I'd never thought about before, never seen, nor had I met anyone else with OI for that matter. He started to help me understand what it was like to be an Episcopalian and help me better understand my faith. I had always been mainstreamed all through grade school in our public schools. But when it came time for me to go to high school, the school wasn't accessible for someone in a wheelchair. There were two buildings and the stairs that connected the two buildings the way the school system was willing to make it accessible was to have me in one classroom, the same one for all four years, and I would only be able to access one of the two cafeterias. My parents realized that this wasn't mainstreaming and tried to fight it, but in the end, they decided to send me to Convent of the Sacred Heart in Greenwich, Connecticut. When my mom first went to look at Sacred Heart, to see if it was accessible for me. She read around with the head of the upper school, who was a nun. And when my mom saw the chapel and heard that we had to go to mass every Friday, she asked if I would be able to receive communion. And I remember my mom telling me that the nun tapped her on the arm and said, oh yes, of course she can. Even our Jewish girls receive. So every Friday I would go to mass, and in the beginning, I found it really difficult to follow the service. I didn't know all their prayers or their responses as a devout Catholic did. But over time, I got really familiar with it, and I even memorized the Hail Mary prayer. I remember going to the mother-daughter liturgy, and when it came to say the time to say the Hail Mary prayer, 
I blurted it right out, word for word. I thought my mom was going to fall out of the pew. She couldn't believe her Episcopal daughter was saying this prayer. A week before my high school graduation, I broke my leg in a car accident. I remember going in the ambulance for the very first time all by myself. There was no cell phones back then, but luckily where the accident happened, some of the friends from youth group were there and knew how to go tell my mom what had happened. At that time, she was working as the parish secretary at St. John's Episcopal Church. While I was in the ER waiting for my parents to show up, I kept saying out loud, I'm so dead, I am so dead. So this nurse in the ER overhears me saying this over and over again. And she came over to me and says, little girl, you aren't dead. You're very much alive. Here, borrow these. And she hands me a set of rosary beads. I thanked her, but denied the rosary beads because I really wasn't sure what to do with them. And I said to her, well, I know I'm alive, but soon I won't be when my parents get here. My parents are gonna kill me when they hear what happened. And I'm pretty sure I've totaled the car. Sure enough, another femur fracture and more bucks traction and another long summer and fall to heal. Not only did I miss my high school graduation, but I also missed out on going to the senior prom. And I remember being too afraid to call my best friend, Matt, to tell him I couldn't go. I had Bill Harper call him. I remember Matt calling me after he found out and said, hey, you know, if you didn't want to go to the prom, you didn't have to go break a leg to get out of it. And then Matt said to me, instead of running a limo, how about we rent an ambulance to take you to the prom? Since I couldn't go to the prom, Bill and Matt brought the prom to me. What a fun evening, despite that I was in the hospital bed, bedridden. I don't remember all the food they brought, but I do remember the champagne and the shrimp cocktail, and they snuck in a VCR and we watched a movie. Also, Matt brought me a corsage and pinned it to my hospital gown. Since I wasn't able to attend my graduation ceremony, the head of the upper school and headmistress brought my diploma personally to me in the hospital, and my parents were able to throw a party in my hospital room. Since I'd been born at Greenwich Hospital, all my fracture treatments were treated there, and the pediatric floor became my second home away from home. Many times, I ended up having a private room, and the nurses always allowed my parents to do special events for me if I was missing out on something really important. Because of that fracture, I ended up starting college a year later than I had planned. In the beginning, I was really bummed not to be able to start in the fall, but I ended up working at my dad's company doing computer work, and we got to go to New Zealand for three weeks. That was the first major trip on an airplane that I'd ever taken. It was an awesome trip, visiting our friends there, whom we had met previously from the International Dinghy Regatta event that my parents were involved with at Larchmont Yacht Club. Also that year, Bill Harper took me to my first rock concert. We saw you too, and boy, was that an amazing night. We both loved that band and remember the conversations we had about all kinds of things. It was a great first rock concert experience. I attended Manhattanville College and I lived on campus. Loved living on campus and in a dorm. It wasn't easy in the beginning, but I learned to adapt and I actually helped others become more aware of what it was like to be disabled. Since I'm the only disabled person on campus, I helped put together a handicap awareness program and we had wheelchairs available for a day for others to try. They got to experience what my life was like on an everyday basis. And they soon realized it wasn't as easy as I made it appear to be. Like most college students, I stopped going to church and didn't find church as important to me as it had when I was in high school. Bill Harper had left to go be rector of his own parish in Chappaqua, New York. And I just didn't have those close ties anymore. While in college, my friend Matt was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma disease. 
He attended Hobart College, but while on chemo, he had to take a semester off and live at home. He wasn't happy about making, having to take the semester off and being back at home. Since Manhattanville College was so close to Larchmont, he used to come visit me to get away and get a break from all the medical stuff. I remember talking to him about God and church, and we were both were complex on why this was happening and not really believing in anything at that point. Matt nowadays is doing amazing and has been in remission for 26 years now. He's married and has four kids. The picture that you're looking at was taken last year, and Matt's the one kneeling down next to me, or bending down next to me, I should say. Um, and his oldest daughter was in college, so she's not seen in that picture. Then the week of my college graduation, I ended up breaking my leg and missed that graduation. It was amazing though, because the students in my class all knew I'd never attended any of my graduations. And they knew I was determined to attend this one. But the reality was I was back in Greenwich Hospital in Bucks Traction for another 18 long weeks. And in that picture, it may be hard to see, but you can see my leg is in traction. That was a newspaper article, and that was the only picture I could find for this week. But I hope you can see some of the traction in there. The Dean of Students, the Provost of the Residential Life, and Cindy, 70 of my classmates, all dressed up in their caps and gown, rented a yellow school bus and came to the hospital and gave me my diploma with a special ceremony. My parents yet threw another graduation party in the hospital for me, but it was really hard dealing with the fracture and having to depend on my parents again until my leg healed, particularly since I just lived away from home for four years and loved living in a dorm. I remember being really bad that I was missing another graduation, missing having to turn down an internship opportunity for the Office of the Disabled in Westchester County, which I had accepted, and just wanting to give up. I remember our minister from St. John's Church coming to visit me and her sitting by my bedside asking me, so where's God in your life right now? How do you feel about all this? I looked at her like she had three heads and said, yeah, uh, God doesn't really exist right now. Not sure, and I don't really care to talk about it. But being the priest that she was, she kept pushing the issue and quizzing me. Finally, I asked her to leave, and she did, but she didn't give up. She then contacted Susie Post, who many of you know, who at that time was working for Christ Church in Greenwich, Connecticut. I remember Susie walking into my hospital room with her collar on. And mind you, I didn't know her at all. And she said, hey, uh, your parish assistant reached out to me in hopes that you might want to talk. And I took one look at Susie and said, well, we can talk about anything you'd like to talk about, but please don't ask me where God is in my life or how I feel about religion right now, because it just doesn't exist. Susie giggled and said, no problem. And from that time forward, we have become great friends and we still are today. After my fracture healed, Matt and I decided to go surprise Bill Harper at his parish in Chappaqua, New York. Bill had been gone for two years now, so we knew it was okay to visit one Sunday at the 10 a.m. service. What was really funny was, here I am three feet tall with my walker, and Matt was completely bald from his chemotherapy and walking with a cane. When we went up to receive communion, the parishioners didn't know whom they should look at first, me or Matt. And it just gave both of us a chuckle. But Bill Harper gave us this huge smile at the altar. And at the end of the service, when we went through the receiving line, Bill said that was an awesome vision, seeing the two of us together after all this time. After my fracture healed, I had to get a job, and I ended up working at Greenwich Hospital, Yale New Haven Health System for 10 years. I worked in the finance department in the insurance collections, then in billing 
and then I worked on the registration in the lab department. And then I went back to the finance department as an analyst. In 1995, the internet had just started to ramp up. And I remember Googling osteogenesis imperfecta, expecting not to find anything. But lo and behold, I found out there was a foundation for my disability. I couldn't believe it, and I was so excited. I inquired about how to meet others with OI and how to get involved. We attended our first national conference. What an amazing experience that was for me to live in my world for four days. I didn't have to explain myself to anyone as everyone was like me and we could all relate to one another. I developed many wonderful friendships, which I still have today. Since then, I've served on the board of directors I've helped create the regional conferences. I co-chair the Florida OI support group, and I've been a speaker throughout the United States and Canada at the regional meetings and national conferences. I chair the Bone China Teas phone fundraiser, and I help mentor teens and parents. The slide you're looking at now was with my mom and me at one of the national meetings. The carpeting at the hotels it's always so thick and difficult to wheel on. And my mom's arthritis was really difficult. So we rented this scooter for her and it was great because I could hook on the back of her and she could pull me around. Actually, this is how many OIRs who are, got manual chairs get around a conference, hooking onto the back of others who have an electric wheelchair. Long trains are usually seen in the hotel, which always brings great laughter particularly when you're going downtown and in a restaurant. We're always a sight to see. In 1997, my dad died, and that was a major life change. Mom and I had to learn without him and his expertise on fixing things, modifying things for me, supporting us and being our cheerleaders. He died of a massive heart attack. I remember our minister at that time in Larchmont didn't know how to provide pastoral care to my mom and me, and just wasn't very compassionate or relatable. It truly was an awful experience and something that I'll never forget. Luckily at that time, my mom was working for St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Riverside, Connecticut. And her boss, Bob Taylor, who was the rector at that time, had offered spiritual guidance and helped us figure out where God might be or helped us better understand what it meant to have a loved one die. For me, losing my dad was major. I was the, as it was the first family member close to me who died. I never got to meet my grandparents as they had all died before I was born or I was too young to remember. Both my parents were single children and I don't have any brothers and sisters. So as you can see, my family is very small. In 2003, my mom and I decided we couldn't afford to live in Larchmont, New York anymore, which is where my mom was born and grew up for over 64 years, and for me, over 35 years. And we moved to Fort Myers, Florida. We didn't know anyone here in Florida, but for us, the cost of living was way cheaper and the weather and accessibility was better for me. It took a while though to really love and accept Florida. Making friends, finding a job, doctors, an Episcopal church were all major challenges. The first year we lived here, my mom ended up working at St. Michael's All Angels. Over that year though, things didn't work out and she was let go and was told we weren't allowed to join this parish. We tried St. Luke's Episcopal Church but the incense were so overwhelming, my lungs and body couldn't take it. I remember going to one service and coughing up a storm and my mom telling me, stop coughing, you're making a scene. We're new here, we don't wanna draw attention. But it's a little hard to give that up. The congregation was very friendly, but not being able to breathe was a major factor. We tried other churches in the area, but nothing sparked our interest and nothing connected with us. Sorry, hold on. Hello. 
Fuck my place. It was a long six years, but in September 2009, Ellen came to St. Michael's All Angels Church, Ellen Sloan. And I remember a neighbor bringing us the red door with Ellen's announcement of being the next rector. Mom and I attended the very first Sunday she arrived, and boy, was that a game changer. She accepted mom and me right away and didn't care that I was disabled. Mom and I were both excited that we had found our church home. Over Ellen's tenure, we'd had many conversations about God was where in my life or not in my life, depending on the situation. In July, 2011, I was in a bad car accident and I fractured my femur all the way through in two places. The car accident wasn't my fault, but it was the most complicated fracture I had ever had. I ended up having to have three surgeries on the femur over a year and a half. And because of that, I lost my flexion in my knee due to scar tissue. After a year and a half of surgeries and physical therapy, I finally made the decision to use my wheelchair full time. Up until this point, I used to use a walker. It was a difficult decision to give up walking, but trying to climb up and down stairs onto chairs or any other thing climbing up on was very challenging and I didn't want to risk fracturing my tibia. It took a while to learn to adapt to this new life, but I looked at it in a positive way. At least I could still get around and have my independence and no longer was homebound or discouraged because I couldn't achieve bending my right knee. Ellen helped guide me to see that God was there, but it sure took a long time for me to realize it. Then in December 18, 2013, 16 years after the anniversary of my dad's death, I fell out of my wheelchair on our paver driveway. I was getting on my wheelchair lift in my van to go to work, and I wasn't paying attention like I should have been. I thought my wheelchair was on the ramp completely, and it wasn't. Only the front casters were. And as the ramp went up, I flipped over backwards and hit the back of my head on the paver driveway. I ended up with a fracture sub epidural hematoma in my skull, and I literally had a half hour left to live. I remember mom called Ellen, and Ellen came right away. The doctors in the ER kept telling me, you know, you're gonna die. We have to do this surgery on your skull. I was really scared, and I remember Ellen saying to the doctors, Stop telling her she's gonna die. She won't, just get her into surgery. My mom was in shock and thank God Ellen was there because she stayed with my mom until I came out of the surgery. While in surgery, they also x-rayed my arms and found I had fractured my left collarbone. This elective surgery was the scariest surgery I've ever gone through and I hope to never have to go through it again. The funny part of the whole event though was the hospital coded my admission as elective surgery instead of as an emergency. Blue Cross Blue Shield, of course, denied the claim. And because of my medical billing background, I was horrified that they had denied it. And when I finally got to the bottom of it, I found out that they had miscoded it as elective. Who in their right mind would go in for elective brain surgery? So now we always refer to that surgery as my elective brain surgery. As you all know, my mom and I lived together. And as she got older, she developed osteoarthritis and walking became very painful for her. Over the last few years of her life, we ended up changing role reversals. Instead of mom taking care of me, I ended up taking care of her. Being an only child, and my parents were only children, so there was no one really else I could depend on. Yes, I do have cousins that live in Massachusetts and Vermont, but it wasn't easy for them to come down and visit. When I tried to reach out for help from my mom, she just said, oh, we've got this, we don't need any help. So no one really knew what I was struggling with as a caregiver. I hid it really well, but the reality was soon settling in and I was realizing that something was gonna have to change. My mom ended up in the hospital due to a major infection 
that went throughout her whole body. And after three weeks, it took her life. What a hard trying time it was to be her advocate, speak up for her because she was nonverbal for the last 10 days of her life and to prove to the medical staff that I was an adult and her advocate and to stop looking at me because I was three feet tall and realize that I am a daughter trying to do what's best for my mom. Also in the back of my mind, I had to take care of myself because I sure couldn't afford to incur a fracture now. And when I get really overtired, I can do some pretty dumb things. Our church, particularly Ellen and Ann Kimball, really helped me tremendously over those three weeks. I was constantly questioning where God was. What was I supposed to be doing? How do I deal with all this? When my dad died, my mom handled everything and wouldn't let me help her. So when she died, I had a lot of learning to catch up on. Ellen and Ann both guided me in ways that although my spirituality was tested, I so valued their advice, thoughts, and help. Mom died five years ago. So much has happened in my life since then. The night mom died, I remember saying to Ann, now what do I do? We've got this great house, but it's only partially accessible for me. Mom did all the cooking, so I had no clue how to cook, let alone be able to reach the stove or the sink or things in the cabinets or the refrigerator on the top shelf. Then many things started to break in the house. So although I knew how to handle certain things and how to hire help to repair things, but I wasn't sure how I was gonna be able to take on this new role of taking care of a house, our two cats, work full time and live independently. I loved my mom greatly, but she was a great protector. So on some level, I was very shy and apprehensive on how this was all gonna work. I did have friends and neighbors worry about me and how I was going to function on my own, but I was determined to prove to them and myself that I could do it. How, I wasn't sure, but I was gonna do it. I've learned how to reach out to friends to ask for help. No one is perfect and asking for help isn't a weakness I've learned, but a strength. I realized after Jenny died that I couldn't clean out the house myself and that I needed help. I've been amazed and truly blessed with all those who have helped me in numerous ways and continue to help me with whatever I need. A major characteristic that I've learned and I still need to remind myself every day. I also realized living alone in the beginning was very lonely and I hated it. It took me quite a while to feel comfortable to be home alone and entertain myself. Then the reality of living in a not so accessible home was hitting me. But then God did his magic to make me listen. Three years ago, my refrigerator, ice maker, water line broke. It must have been leaking for quite a while because the kitchen floor behind and under the refrigerator was completely warped. The wall behind the refrigerator was moldy as well as the cabinets next to the refrigerator. So I had to learn how to deal with homeowners insurance and start interviewing contractors to redo my kitchen. That was an interesting learning experience dealing with contractors to get quotes and not let them take advantage of me because I'm a single disabled woman. I also felt this was mom and dad's way of telling me, okay, well, if you're gonna stay in the house, we gotta make it accessible kitchen. And if you're not gonna make it accessible, we'll create this disaster so that you'll have to make it accessible. With the help of my financial advisor, I learned how to go about getting a home equity loan. And I was very lucky because one of the coworkers I worked with, husband, was a contractor. And he helped me redo the bathroom and the kitchen, the master bath and the kitchen. It was an overwhelming project, but I'm now thrilled. And I can honestly say I love my home. I always liked our home before, but it was my mom and dad's decorating ideas. And I'd never been given a chance to decorate a house on my own. With major encouragement from many friends and family, 
I finally bit the bullet and have now learned how to cook and love to have friends over and entertain. I also realized it brought me back to that wonderful conversation I had with Bill Harper back in high school when he asked me, what would it be like to live in a house that was accessible for me? That dream was now a true reality. I've had many orthopedic surgeons over my 52 years, but it's incredibly difficult to find dedicated surgeons who know and have treated or want to treat OI patients, particularly since there's only 25 to 50,000 people in the United States with OI. In 2018 though, my left femur started to give me a problem and I had to have it go checked out. The challenge was very real that I missed find an orthopedic doctor to treat me as I knew something was wrong. I was recommended by another doctor to go see Dr. Sorello. He ordered a CAT scan and an MRI and found out that after 18 years, the rod was migrating out of my left femur. Dr. Sorello and I agreed that it was best to take the rod out since it was pushing on one of the main blood arteries in my leg and causing numbness. He removed the rod successfully, and we were hoping that I wouldn't have to have another rod put in its place in my femur since I was 50 years, one years old and not walking. But as life turns out, in September of 2019, as I was getting out of my wheelchair to get in the driver's seat, I twisted my leg the wrong way and broke the left femur completely in half. I'm incredibly thankful for Dr. Soreo and his nurse practitioner, Brittany Garrett, who rebuilt my left femur with a fibula rod, which has never been done before. Dr. Soreo spent many hours the night before my surgery, looking at the CAT scan and the x-rays to figure out exactly what size rod would fit in my femur. Of course, because of me having a lie, the regular size femur rods weren't the correct length or diameter. So finding a rod to fit just right was a challenge. Dr. Sorello had three different plans before going into this surgery. But luckily, the first plan with the fibular rod was the best option. And at that same time, he had to create plates and screws to go above and below the femur rod at either end to secure it so that it wouldn't migrate out in the future. He built all this right next to the operating table, all custom made. It was a five hour surgery and it was a very long night, but it was so worth it. There were complications with an infection that developed in my leg, but thankfully both he and Brittany knew what was happening and was able to take care of it right away. Yes, it was an incredibly long 10 weeks, something Dr. Sorello and Brittany and I did not want to have to go through, but thankful for them for picking up on the infection and taking care of it right away. Two more surgeries were required, but luckily the infection didn't go to the rod or the femur. I was in patient rehab in between each of these surgeries, and it was a tough road, but I'm incredibly thankful for his team that took care of me and for Dr. Sorello's talents, creativity, and innovative thought process with this complex surgery. There were many times I thought, really God, another complication, another surgery? But I can honestly say after four months, my left femur was completely healed and I was back being independent again. Being an adult with OI, having a fracture heal in four months is amazing. I'd never had a fracture to that extent heal so quickly. And I know all the prayers, the cards, the texts, the visits, and thoughts from all of you helped give me the strength to stay on course and work on my rehab. If it hadn't been for all of you, I wouldn't have gotten through that challenge the way I did, particularly since these surgeries were the first ones without either of my parents. The bummer part is Dr. Sreo has left Lee Memorial Health System as of last year to be one of the top orthopedic surgeon, trauma surgeons at Cleveland Clinic 
in Cleveland, Ohio. He and his wife are truly dedicated though to OI as they came to an OI fundraiser last January in Naples, the night before they moved. And he got to meet the CEO of the OI Foundation and one of the top OI doctors from Hospital for Special Surgery. He's now getting involved in the OI Foundation with a plan to help other OIers in the Ohio area. And he's also in the process of writing my case up to be published in a medical journal. And the picture that you're looking at is of me with Amber Gray, who lives in Cape Coral, my friend with OI, and Dr. Sereo and his wife. Now that we've just gone through a year of lockdown due to COVID, I was just starting to get back into reality from my femur fracture and driving again. And then we were all told to social distance, restaurants were closed, trips were canceled, and friends visiting out of state were canceled. I was extremely frustrated because I felt I'd already done my quarantine and this was just extending it. I'd also lost my job on De December 2019 because I had exhausted all my vacation time and my benefits. So again, I had to take on the challenge and figure out what I would do with myself like everyone else. I'm incredibly thankful for what I've learned and experienced this past year. Not working has been a wonderful time for me because I've been able to help others and get more involved in activities I've always wanted to do or learn like quilling cards. I continue to do a lot of volunteer work with the OI Foundation, and I'm back volunteering at Ding Darling on Friday afternoons at the welcome desk. But overall, if it hadn't been for this parish, I don't think I would have survived as well as I have over this past year. I've enjoyed getting more involved with you all, meeting new people, making new friends, expanding other friendships, as well as helping you all learn Zoom, running the Sunday Zoom social, being part of the digital ministry, the Christian education ministry, and was honored and felt privileged to have been involved in the search committee that helped choose Bill and Sue Benas. Alan Kimmeret, our interim, always said, God has chosen someone for St. Michael's All Angels. We just have to find out whom he or she was sending. And I remember Bruce Patterson, head of the search committee, saying, well, with COVID, I don't know how we're gonna choose a rector since we can't travel. We're gonna need to think outside the box. Never being on a search committee before, I didn't know what he meant, think outside the box. Then it hit me one night after our meeting. Go look at websites, listen to the sermons, observe their churches online services, search as much as you can on the internet. That's when Bill kept popping up to the top of my pile. And that's when we narrowed it down. And as we narrowed it down, I got to sneak into Bill's Bible study. Mind you, I'd been to Bible studies before, but I really love the way Bill runs it. I have learned all kinds of stuff that I never knew or why things are the way they are or behind meaning behind more things. I saw what Bill and Sue had done at St. Paul's in Duluth, Minnesota during the pandemic, and I was excited at the new opportunities that would be available to us at St. Michael's in the fall. Since Bill and Sue have arrived, there are quite a few times I've said to both of them, why is God testing us or letting this happen? What is all behind this? What's the point? This was particularly evident once the vaccines were coming out and I wasn't able to get one because I wasn't, I was under 65. Even though I was disabled, I stood in, still couldn't get the vaccine and I was so frustrated. I had exhausted all means and outlets in getting one, but both Bill and Sue said, don't give up, something's gonna happen, you'll get it. And I said to them, yeah, maybe in 10 years after everybody over 65 gets it and then they'll let the compromised people get it. Even though we all laughed about it, they knew I was at my wit's end. But on the last day of when I literally lost all hope, something did happen through a wonderful connection of a friend, of a friend 
And I got my first dose on February 10th, 2021. As they say, sometimes it takes a village to make something happen. And I feel that everyone at St. Michael's All Angels is an amazing village where we all chip in together and help one another. I've been incredibly excited to be part of the Vaccine Angel ministry team and share that same feeling I had once I got that first dose. Phil and Sue have taught me more to believe and have faith over the last seven months. As I get older, everything is finally starting to make sense, and I'm seeing and experiencing more about my faith in my life. It amazes me how far I've come and yet how much more I have to experience, hope to experience, but it's still all falling into place, and it's a wonderful journey. What I've learned and continue to learn is that we are only given one chance at life. It won't always be easy, and I can attest to that, but I also know my motto since I was a little kid is to say, never give up and to be the little engine that could, that kept saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Thank you. Wow, Susie, what a wonderful, wonderful story that you have shared with us, your life story. I learned a lot, and I'm sure others did too. And so now I'm going to move people over so that we can all join in in thanking Susie for sharing her story and ask questions or comment on all of her wonderful reflections. So I'm gonna keep moving people over here. Do you need help? <laughs> I'm slowly but surely getting there. All right. Oh, actually, think... you won't let me because you're a host. You didn't make me go. <laughs> <I> can't help. <laughs> I think I'm getting down to the bottom here. <laughs> All right, a few more. Everyone's clapping their hands. Wonderful. <laughs> there. Okay, I think we got everyone. So if anyone has questions or comments, just feel free to unmute yourself and raise your hand. And... Yes, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> Susie, that was wonderful. We're friends, but I didn't know the, the whole story. You're a miracle, honey. Thank you for being my friend. You're welcome. Thank you for having me do this tonight. Yeah. Was Greg good... suffered me into it. <laughs> <laughs> Luann. Thanks, Sue. Susie, this is great. I mean, I was there for some of this, and it was still a great story. To <laughs> hear. <laughs> so um, one of the things that you have made me so aware is, uh, of our accessibility issues, especially right here in our own neighborhood. Yes. And we had an experience just last weekend. And I wonder if you'll tell folks about that and also comment on what we can do about making beautiful Sanibel, more accessible to more. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, volunteering at Ding Darling, I'm always saying, oh, go to the Bailey Track. Oh, go to Indigo Trail. It's great places to see birds. But I can't tell people that it's really not accessible for somebody in a wheelchair. So they are now offering mindfulness meditation walks. And Luann being in her field, um, with mindful meditation and healthy living. Um, I, I texted her and I said, hey, they're offering this. Would you want to go to the Bailey Track? She said, oh, I'd love to. And I said, all right, one stipulation, you're going to have to help push me because I know it's not going to be really accessible. No problem. And I said, you know, I'll try and wheel as much as I can around the whole loop, but I don't know how much I'll be able to do. No problem. Well, when we got there, we both looked at each other like, yeah, you're not gonna be able to wheel any of this by myself. Um, and it worked out great. Thank God for Luann, because we went over all kinds of rough terrain, but you know, it is frustrating. Um, 
not being able to do things like that. Um, I wish there were ways that they would, you know, put either planking down or wood tiling down or, um, you know, wood planks or something to make it more accessible. Um, there are a couple of parks here that do have boardwalks that are accessible. And, you know, I love Ding Darling Drive because I can drive through it. Um, I noticed one of my friends here, Anne-Marie is online. Um, don't, don't kill me, Anne-Marie, but if you want to chime in, um, she also has a eye, loves going birding, um, and is in an electric wheelchair um, and drives a modified van. And I know that she and I have had many discussions about trying to make more parks accessible. Um, and it's just something you either have to learn to live with and figure out friends to travel with to help you over those things. Um, Anne-Marie, what, what would you say? No, it's, it's true. Um, there just needs to be more awareness to make things more accessible, more paths, you know, um, mm -hmm. hard packed dirt or concrete yeah. if possible. Hmm. So, you know, there's all, you can't make them all accessible. Obviously, if they're going up steep hills, you can only do so much, but um, if there's things you can do to pave or hard pack dirt, um, I don't know if that's possible in Florida, but I've seen them do it out here. Obviously, if it's a swamp, that's not going to happen, but um, there are things you can do. And the most important thing, I think, is to get folks who are disabled involved. Get them involved in the planning, get their opinion, get their thoughts. I mean, they do make, they do make beach wheelchairs, um, which maybe you've seen and you can rent those at Billy Bikes. But yes. the wheelchairs, for the beach wheelchairs, are so big that somebody... Right who is disabled is not able to wheel it themselves. So it's not like I can just go rent one out for the day and go to the beach by myself. And, no, you're right. You, you can't be independent in those um, because you can't wheel them. They're nice. It gives you, if you have a friend that can push you, you can actually be on the beach by the water, but it's not quite the same. You're right. And they do make, um, a, it's a special contraction. I don't know the actual name of it, but it's a, it's a track chair that actually your wheelchair fits in this track and it kind of looks, the tracks have like a, I don't, do you know the, the name of it, Amy? Nah. It's got a track where you kind of push through and it will go over rough terrain and, okay. you know, grass and all that. But they're like six, seven, eight thousand dollars and of course insurance doesn't pay yeah. for that. So it's not something that I'm just going to go out and buy and be like, yay, you know, yeah. I can go to the beach now or, you know, over this rough terrain. Yeah, Candy, I mean, there are oh. different options. I think Candy Love had a question. Candy, did you? Actually, it wasn't a question, just a, an affirmation. Others said, thank you for sharing your story. I, I just so appreciate your candidness. Um, there, was, there was just a, a frankness and an ease with talking about you know, great difficulties and, and disabilities and surgeries and, and pain. And, and it, was, it was presented with such heartfelt uh, acceptance that we don't always get to in our lives. And, and um, I know in my personal life, I've had a variety of situations that were challenging. Um, and, and I don't know if I accepted them as with much grace as you did. And so to share the complete story and, and, and weave your, your spiritual connection into it um, was very inspiring. So thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that as Susie's friend. I've known her for probably 25, 35 years, and uh, I even learned something. And, yes, she has faced a lot of challenges. I mean, she has her days. We all do. But she has overcome every single one of them and been stronger when she comes out of it. So you're right. Okay. And Kimball. Yes, I just wanted to say, I knew that you showed a few pictures of your renovations for your kitchen, but you kind of didn't explain them because they are so amazing and they have become sort of a, a model now for other people to, to take a look at because Susie and her builder together came together with these amazing, amazing things that work so well. For example, the, the, the faucet on the sink is not back where faucets usually are. It's up in the very front where Susie can reach it. Here, Sue, and, maybe you could pull up the picture. Sure. It, it really is amazing. You could describe it better than I, but this is fun to look at. <laughs> back, 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 back to the 
to this to the there 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 we go that's so I, can you all see this it may not be the best picture but um in the back you'll see the sink area has been lowered and you'll see that the faucet is right in the front there correct Sue? um and there's the faucet part but the handle to get the water is right where Sue's pointing with the white thing and then just below it this round circle thing here is for the garbage disposal because it used to be on the back wall and I couldn't reach it. And right next to it, you can't see the dish towels holding it, but um, there's a white switch there and that turns an, on and off all the under counter lights underneath the cabinets. And then over here with the stove, I mean the oven, sorry, um, the door opens out to the side. It doesn't pull down, um, which is great. So that way I won't fall in the oven which is kind of important. <laughs> um, when it pulls down, it's harder because you can't get a wheelchair quite in there. And then over here is my uh, cooktop, um, and it's an electric cooktop. Um, it's an induction cooktop. Um, and for those of you that don't know what induction is, um, you will not burn yourself on it. Um, and it takes special pots because it's all magnetic. Um, and I felt since I was learning, it was probably a good idea to get the induction cooktop since I didn't want to burn myself cooking. Maybe the next slide. So this is showing you better the, the, stick, the oven. Um, and then all these cabinets over on this side, all, or, I'm sorry, one of these cabinets has um, the pull down unit, which we'll show you on the next slide. Oops, Oops. wait, go back for just a second. There we go. Um, and you can see I put the refrigerator over on this side. The refrigerator used to be over on the other wall. And what we did, but the problem was um, when I opened up the door, I couldn't get in all the way because it was hitting the wall. So we moved it over here and we opened up the wall more. So now the freezer side door opens up all the way so I can get the wheelchair completely in there and reach things. And Sue, can you do the pull down shelves? Yep. It was a, it was a yep. slide before. So this, um, it's a wonderful unit and anybody can get this. It doesn't matter if you're disabled or not disabled. It's called Revishelf. And what it is, is you, you can buy them at Home Depot, Lowe's, Amazon, anywhere. And they make a bigger unit. But this unit, um, as you can see, I have a stick here which is also the stick I'm showing you on the very far right. Um, and I hook the stick on and I pull. And as I pull on that stick, it lowers the whole shelf down. And so I can reach everything that would be in this cabinet. Now, obviously I can't reach the top two shelves, but um, I have you know plastic containers in one cabinet. I have my tea and coffee in another cabinet. I have chips and you know, extra stuff in another cabinet. So it works out really well because I'm able to utilize the top cabinets as well as the bottom cabinet. It's really remarkable. And she's done such a good job. It's really all invented. And now she goes and talks about this at the CI, the, o, the, o, the OI national OI conferences. Meetings, the OI meetings, because a lot of people have never heard of anything like this. It's great. And then you want to pull up the bathroom pictures, Sue? Sure. Because some people might be interested in the shower part. Thanks. So in this one, um, you can see I've lowered the, sh the kitchen sink, or, sorry, the bathroom sink um, to make it more accessible. And then you can see I can fit my wheelchair underneath it. And then the next slide shows you um, there's a ramp that we built up. This used to be a huge walk or a huge bathtub, one of those deep, deep tubs and a walk-in shower that was very narrow. And what we did was we ripped all that out and we built in a ramp and I go up and I turn the wheelchair around so I'm facing frontwards, but I can open up the side of my wheelchair and it's the same height as my wheelchair, this bench. And I can just slide right across and my feet sit on here, but I'm up here and I can take a shower and then slide back easily back into the wheelchair. So that's how I've modified the bathroom. Before, 
when mom was alive, I had to bath him upstairs and that was a regular bathtub. So I had one of those portable <laughs> shower benches that was half in the tub, half out of the tub. And I hate it when my feet can't touch the floor. So because the bench was so high for me to transfer onto, my feet were dangling in the air. So then we had a red bucket turned upside down that was in the tub that my feet used to sit on. And when I started to talk to my contractor about redoing the master bath so I could move downstairs, he's like, well, what's the matter with the bathroom upstairs? And he took one look at the shower and he was like, well, this is an accident waiting to happen. And so thank goodness he was great. And we did both projects at the same time. Any other questions? Last my questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Susie, for sharing your story. And thank you to all of you who have joined us tonight. This will be recorded and put on the website either tonight or tomorrow morning. So you can share it with people and spread the good news of Susie's wonderful story with many. So thank you all for joining us tonight.